So Utah places. Phillips has this beautiful thing about how we're all standing in this big, long, wide river. And our elders and our ancestors are the tributaries and the streams that lead into this river. And when you make something, when you create a piece of art, you're putting that maybe a little boat or something right into the river and that's going to flow downstream and you don't know who further down the stream is going to find it but they will find it and they will take from it what they need to get through this world you know Welcome to the Morse Code Podcast, where we talk with entrepreneurially minded creatives in music, film, and writing. My name's Corby, and I'm hoping these conversations inspire you to push deeper into your own work, whether you're a full-time professional or just starting out on your own creative odyssey. The Morse Code Podcast is celebrating its sixth month anniversary with a live show. It's happening Sunday, April 14th at the Five Spot here in East Nashville. Many of the guests we've had on the show are performing or reading or painting that night. Guests like Joe Pasapia, Abigail Comst, Jill Andrews, and tons more. Grab your tickets at CorbyLanker.com and we will see you there. Alex Berger is a longtime artist, photographer, filmmaker, and as I found something of an artist whisperer. As founder and creative director of Nashville-based creative agency Weird Candy, he shepherded the visual translation of artists like Bedroom, The Criticals, and Yacht Club, as well as tastemaker labels like War Buddha and Three Sirens Music Group. We kick off this conversation with Alex offering an impromptu brand appraisal of uh, me. And with that, we jump into a discussion of why artists have such a hard time tackling the necessity of articulating their particular flavor in a succinct and relatable way. If you get something out of the Morse Code podcast, please like and subscribe. And now here's my conversation with Alex Berger. Alex Berger, it's great to see you, man. Thank you for making a little time for us. Thanks for having me. You have great no idea you. what voyage we are about to set up on, and nor do I. So. Yeah, same. I'm excited. I'm a, I'm a little... Um, as soon as you said my name, I suddenly got nervous. <clears throat> That's intimidating when, you know, sitting across from me, you, this once I was lo- intellectual juggernaut you see before you. Once you had me locked in the gaze, I was... Yeah, uh, that too. Suddenly it's a, transfixed. It's a difficult circumstance. It felt very small. Um, well, I thought maybe we could start... There's, I have some ideas. Okay. And I also I'm looking forward to learning a few things about your take on... Um, I, I, I think a very neglected aspect of the game for me, from my angle, which is sort of a brand identity and a brand consciousness. And I, and I, maybe I'm putting it wrongly. So you can say like, like sometimes people, if you say the word content, they really bristle and I don't exactly bristle, but I barf in my mouth a little bit, but I keep it to myself. Um, so, but first and foremost, uh, you are a musician and that is how we knew each other initially. Yeah, I believe so. I think, yeah, it was, I know music. so. Yes, you know, so I know. So yeah, I, 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 my recollection is first meeting you at a show that you were performing at and you may not remember me, uh, approaching you after the show, but, um, my wife and I were living with a British songwriter here in Nashville mm-hmm. and she was playing a show. You were on the bell. And I was, um, just like at the start of the podcast, I was transfixed. And, um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I remember going up to you afterwards and I, I, I seem to remember telling you that you reminded me of Danny Kay uh. as, as a, as a, and meaning that as a great compliment and, and being, uh, surprised that I, I don't know if you immediately knew who that was. And then I, and I, I realized that I'm a lot older than I look sometimes, but I, I still don't know who that is. I'd really be embarrassed to say that. Oh, I mean, the name you've had like 10 years to, to look that up. That one. Yeah. Um, yeah, Danny K, uh, my father's a big fan of his, just like a very charming and, uh, eloquent, multi-talented performer mm-hmm. of yesteryear. And, um, but over the years, I think my, when I think of you, as soon as you mentioned branding, yeah, Danny K is still in there, but there's a few other. Ooh, 
because I mean we don't my I don't not to I'll just say because you you said it at the start I agree the term content is pretty gross mm. and even like branding and brand identities eh, it's pretty gross too yeah it's a little gross um, but but I did hear somebody I wish I could remember who said this but someone once told me that branding is um, uh, what people say about you when you're not in the room mm. or what people think about you when you're not in the room and so when it's I, pretty good yeah and when i think about you when you're not in the room which i is, wasn't asking but since yeah. you started i think when i think of corby there's something quite magical <laughs> about corby in my mind this is this is your branding right. for okay. me this is branding exercise and um, unsolicited so there's there's a, there's definitely some danny k who you should still look up and um, there's like a little, there's a touch of like Willy Wonka in there. Fair. There's um, there's also like a like a, a little Neil Simon, I want to say maybe a like a Capra, um, but just like this blend of like sort of charm and wit and eloquence, but also uh, yeah, there's there's a, a mischievous and um, and uh, almost like pixie-like thread that is, uh, I feel like is, is, is interesting to me. But anyway, so well, there you go. you'll get no pushback from me, sir. Um, that's really <laughs> kindly uh, said. And um, when you said that something about the mischievous thing and the, like the Willy Wonka thing lands to mostly because of that era where I was wearing a, a bow tie. I did not appear publicly without one in this like velvet jacket. And I was really kind of going for a thing, um, which was Willy Wonka E and oh, okay. a little, uh, I think that my, my brand is kind of friendly, but I, I don't want to dwell on that. And, um, cause this is more about you, but it's also, also just sort of about a interest. I like conversations about ideas and you're full mm. of them. Um, but when you said the mischievous thing, it like reminded me of this experience I had as a young, uh, impressionable man of young man of probably 15 was when this happened. And my brother, I had a, I have two older half brothers. One of them was in the Marines at the time and he would mm. send a shoebox home every six months or so and something for mom, something for dad. But then for me were these mixed tapes and most, some of them were labeled, some of them weren't tapes, like cassette tapes, you know? And um, I was just, I grew up in rural Idaho my, to a family of non-musicians. My parents have never listened to music. They still really don't, unless it's a church. Um, they never bought a record or anything. Um, it's a miracle that we're talking today. Uh, but so these were like really rare sources of music and, and they were mysterious too, because they were like, some of them were labeled and he, his tastes ran to like Bauhaus, Love and Rockets, Depeche Mode, you know, early records, like kind of, you'd call that like eighties new wave. Right. Um, and th I liked those fine tones on tail, um, misfits. I was a little too scary for me, but, uh, there was this one tape and, um, you're not labeled and, I just put it in and it's just like an, a single electric guitar and it's like kind of reedy voice. And it's like, Oh sister, haven't you heard some things from people like words without a word? And what that means is that some people don't talk. And then like in comes this like crashing uh, bass and drums, like in a garage band style recording, just really raw. And I was fucking, this, this is what lit my world on fire. And the whole tape was like that. It was this one single band unlabeled, no idea who it was. Wow. And uh, I carried that with me for about three years, probably in till one day I'm out in public and I hear the song and I'm like, God. And it was at a, it was at a, a a coffee shop or something. So it was like, so one of the kids put it on. I was like, who was that? And, uh, it was the violent femmes second record. Wow. Um, they're not the one that has blister in the sun on it and everything. And, um, to this day, I still feel like I'm in search of that feeling. Like, because it was so immediate and, and unrefined and like, like kind of so, um, disrespectful in the coolest way. Like, I, I don't know the guy, the lead singer, um, maybe had a background in 
like as a preacher or something like that, but you could feel that energy and he like was Sam like mad kind of about that. it. Yeah, yeah. Kinnison Kines- yeah. energy for <clears> sure. <throat> um, but also the quality of the recordings were just, you know, tossed off. It's still like, you know, fidelity and everything, but there was no over-engineering. And man, that is so exciting, you know, and it, it even more so, it like makes me want to go find this record when we're done, I'm going to go find it. Because even more so in an age of um, endless shellacking and nudging drums mm. right into the groove and everything is just so just just so just so um even the imperfections are i feel like dialed in even. yeah no for sure like on purpose everything yeah. is so deliberate you know i i feel like i have some bad good and bad news for you i can't wait so i feel like the bad news is that in my in my humble uh submission that the art that tends to impact us in the most significant way, as you experience, then um, it almost uh, it's almost a requirement that it's that it's not something we were seeking. Mm. So the fact that you're looking for that, you will never find it by looking for it. It will mm. find you. So the good news is you will continue to have those, but they will always come at the times and places that you are not anticipating or expecting them. So hard to hear, but likely true. I feel like the, uh, I'm just speaking for myself. I feel like the music and the films and, um, and definitely the films where you went in with no expectation. You hadn't seen the trailer. You didn't even really know what Mm. you were going to be seeing tend to be the ones that have the most impact. If you know, if they don't suck, of course, um, and I think the other part of what you said that I, is a really, really core to, I would say, my own process now is that feeling that you had um, when when you get hit by an idea, and even just then you were sort of trying to uh, describe what were the elements that made it land mm-hmm. for you in that moment. And I feel like that sometimes is the biggest challenge because, um, I mean, just as an example, I, I have a very vivid memory when I lived in uh, the East Village in New York. When I was walking down Avenue B and this huge uh, pickup was blasting the most incredible music I've ever heard. And I ran up to the guy's window and I was like, what is this? This is incredible. And he told me and I was like, I'm going to look this up right away. Mm-hmm. And I guess I didn't, or by the time I got home, I'd forgotten what it was. And to this day, I still think about that music in that moment. And like, I'm so hoping cool. I'm going to have a moment like you have where I'm going to hear it out in the wild somewhere. And, you know, 20 years later, I'll, but I'll know it. I'll for sure, for sure. Even though I probably only heard it for like, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 seconds. Yeah. Um, but trying to, you know, the beauty of music and I, uh, particularly music and also of, uh, of visuals of film, I think is the, its ability to, uh, to hold, uh, I think David Lynch uh, puts it more eloquently than I'm about to, uh, something about, um, it's just able to hold up ab- abstractions, mm-hmm. uh, in a way that words and lyrics, you know, as soon as you define something, um, it's somehow it can some, sometimes can rub it of some of the surrounding oh for sure right and so so i think when you get hit by that inspiration or that idea whatever the idea was you know uh that trying to sort of transcribe what what that was so that when you revisit it it gives you the, the same feeling that you had the first time you had it if you've if you've ever had an idea for a song or an app or anything mm. and you didn't write it down and then you wake up the next morning and it you have you, all you remember all you have the memory of is that you had a great idea but you have no recollection of i don't know if you've ever had that experience yeah it, uh, regularly right and so i, I feel like our job uh, as artists is to be prepared mm. uh, in whatever medium that is so that when these things hit you have a way of in whatever that means for you of 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 holding on to the the you know the core the idea of it so that you can then serve and stay true to that you know down the line um i have a couple of thoughts on that and to be for just clarity purposes 
I feel like when I looking for that feeling that I'm talking about, I'm mm-hmm. trying to find it in my, in, I'm thinking about records right now. Cause I'm kind of making another set of recordings and I've been on this journey to get at something of that spirit in my own music in one way or another since the be- very beginning. Um, so it's like for me less about finding that thing there's in, the, in more about like finding a way to express whatever that ineffable quality mm-hmm. was that I heard in myself. Mm-hmm. I feel like a guy, you know, I made eight records and I'm a pretty good songwriter. I feel like that's maybe of the things that I do. I think I do that better than playing guitar for sure. And singing, I don't think that I've made a record that I'm like, fuck yeah. I made some records that I'm like, that have moments where I'm like that track. I'd stand, I'd put that track against anything. Um, I would really love to make, and I, I don't even know if I'm going to make a record, but um, it just, I would, I'm really excited about this new season of sort of focused moments in music. Um, it's really complicated. I say this and I'm, I think about like the music that's meant most to me versus what's done best. And those are obviously probably going to be the different. Mm-hmm. Um, and the music that's done best for me is so quaffed and so um, hyper uh, intentional and so too like, so beat detective. Um, and so and maybe not so pitched, but it's just like, you know, very, unper- and it's just, I'd say, honestly, it's great. It's like I worked with the producer and I would just like deferred to him. Um, it was like my songs and my singing and his vision mm-hmm. and I'm handsome. And I keep thinking about going back to that because it's a great relationship. And he's the, of the, all of my friends, like the, the, doing the biggest stuff. So there's a part of me that's like, I don't know why I'm telling you this, um, but I'm going to get wrap it up so we can move on. Um, but there's a part of me that's, uh, I'm always like want to buck the correct thing to do the um predictably productive the most likely to occur in in a positive result Mm. thing to do i kind of always just want to be like and i i think i you know part of the reason why i'm where i'm at in my life good and bad is because i've sort of veered um you know an example of that would be two records ago i did a record where i recorded almost all of it in Idaho outside. I bought a batter car battery and mm. drove out there with some gear and I recorded all these songs that were important to me as a, in places that were important to me as a child. And so I, I still wonder why I did that. And part of it was like, I just wanted to have a different story with the record. I just wanted to get out of a recording studio. I don't find recording studios to be terribly inspiring, especially the, the more state of the mm. art they are. Um, and also with the technology, you're, you're kind of a fool if you don't take advantage of some of the power of, of tech, you know, the, the advances have been ridiculous, um, both bad and good. Uh, but anyway, that right. Making that record that way in Idaho was sort of an attempt to get at something raw and also like associative to places of meaning for me personally. I absolutely love that record. And it really, it definitely imbued it with this additional element of, uh, that I think you were, that you were seeking and that mm. ultimately served the songs. Well, the that's very kind of you to say, and I wasn't even and fishing for that. And I didn't no, even know but, you had heard that. No, right. no, I, 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 I think that, um, the trouble with the likes of, I'm going to, uh, compliment myself by adding myself to this sentence, but the, the, the problem with the likes of you and me, Corby, is a, that 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 thing that's hard to get away from is actually on the list for uh for old al's uh, therapist coming up soon but that 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 feeling of like needing to resist or rebel against the thing that you're supposed to do in some way is inherent with being uh i would say an independent artist mm-hmm. because just the fact that you are that in it, in and of itself it's, it's sort of self-fulfilling right and um uh, the thing I, I, the things I always try and come back to are, um, so I went to acting school. I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in I New York City, that. and I had um, some amazing teachers and directors. And one of them, uh, there's a famous quote. I'm sure you probably know it by Martha Graham. 
You know Martha Graham? I don't. So Martha Graham was a great American, probably maybe the great American choreographer mm. and in the dance world. And she has this beautiful quote about being an artist and how your only job is just to, is to keep the, the channel open and be mm. aware of and ready to express these ideas or these, you know, uh, visions that come to you. And that's basically it. She says there's no satisfaction ever mm-hmm. at any time, only a strange uh, dissatisfaction, which keeps us moving and uh, makes life a little bit more interesting. Mm-hmm. That last part, I, I'm paraphrasing. But I think that the biggest thing was is that it's, it's not up to us to judge our work or to compare it to others. It's just to keep doing the thing and trying to serve that the best i think if i if i'm if i'm remembering her right i have a friend an incredible um painter named um emily leonard and she was actually maybe my first roommate here in nashville and she's gone on to have a stellar career and i think that i have her book um martha graham's book i think she has an autobiography and i read it and um i emily if you're listening i owe you that book back i'll post it soon um (laughs) But another thing that I've, if this was the same person, I'm just going to combine these sure. two people into one, uh, was the pragmatic um, advantage or maybe a essential practice of r- ritualizing your your pursuit. Um, hmm. and, and she talked about how she would go, you know, she'd wake up roughly around the same time in her apartment in New York, catch a cab she's already kind of getting her mind around the coming day. And, you know, she's moved from the space of the mundane world into the space of this like sacred exploratory world. And, and then she gets out of the cab and she gets her cup of coffee. The ritual continues. She's getting, you know, by the time she hits the dance floor, she's ready to work. And that process was, she said, you know, was essential to her really, you know, long and lustrous career. I, I think there's a lot to that. Um, especially as you, Um, this is my experience and also I don't know how accurate I'm being whenever you like turn the lens on yourself you're like am I is this lens when was the last time this thing was calibrated oh yeah Um, I'm familiar but uh, when I was young I was just so full of piss and vigor and determined to be you know successful maybe at Mm. all costs and but I was like priority number one and there was nothing standing in my way in terms of like commitments and obligations I just except for my own ability to commit and, you know, and be inspired and have vision. Uh, and so those things were like, consequently, um, they were, it was sort of a bursting quality of punctuated with long bouts of laziness and indulgence and chasing girls and whatever. Um, and material. Yeah. yeah, You got to live too. And so I am not going to, you know, poop on myself too hard. But, uh, now as I get older, I find that just like, um, uh, I'm slower in kind of good and bad ways and I'm slow to respond to things that are um, wanting to always kind of nudge me out of my my momentum and my groove uh, but I'm also just like I don't uh, I don't just suddenly get seized with the notion to write a song in 10 minutes but um, I think that the trade-off for that lack of like explosive nature that maybe was part of my youth um, is just this like super um a strong commitment to a routine of creation sort of on a daily basis at all costs. And for me, that's like, you know, first thing in the morning, read for 25 minutes um, and then a little bit more because it's too fun. And then write, you know, between 500 and 750 words on this novel thing that I'm doing. And man, it's really strange and lonely and terrifying and also wonderful to be on a journey where, uh, it's the project is big enough that it's not going to be done. I know for two years, likely at the earliest, it might be terrible. All, you know, it might be pointless. It also won't is least likely to yield anything monetarily for myself and my family. <laughs> um, so it feels like I'm getting away with something too. And that's also why it has to happen at the very beginning of the day, mm. because I spend the rest of the day just doing stuff that is, that matters more or is more grounded or more, um, the intervals are, are quicker. You finish, you know, like this podcast, we'll, we'll finish this conversation. It'll be up in a few weeks. Mm. Um, 
but uh, I, I guess I haven't like, signed the release just yet. But yeah, <laughs> the uh, okay. Mm. Well, well, uh, pending pending your approval. I don't know if any of what I've said is usable, but I, I would say that um, the um, that routine. I mean, listen, you know, looking through like the the art lens, you know, one could argue like that that time dedicated to reading and writing is is the most meaningful and is, and is actually going to have the most lasting impact um, versus everything else that's sort of required as part of you know current uh, societal. Uh, needs um yeah and, and i and that actually yeah i i think it's it's pretty beautiful that you have that and it, it that it seems to be pretty common amongst a lot of the artists that you know the royal we tend to admire most is mm. some sort of you know ritual or habits um uh amber rubarth who i believe you're yeah. you're well, well love very her. familiar i love amber so she w once recommended uh stephen king's book on writing, on writing. fantastic yeah it's just such a you know pragmatic um i've recommended that to a number of people since a lot of great just nuts and bolts advice on how to go from as you said the sort of purely impulsive um artist to one that can actually you know be a little bit more you know, make the most of the time that, that we have. Um, and I also think, um, I mean, I, I think of him a lot, but, uh, you know, again, like David Lynch is, you know, famously ate at the, the same lunch at the same spot for mm -hmm. what, you know, 10, 20 years, mm -hmm. just because it, uh, it was one less thing he had to sort of think about, yeah. dedicate. Um, and uh, I, I totally get that. Yeah, I think it was uh, some burger, burger joint. Um, In LA. I remember. Yeah, so I don't know if his his cardiologist was too happy about it, but his <laughs> but from a creative point of view, he was you know it, it freed him up. Um, so yeah, I I think that's important. Of course, you know, I it's it's no surprise to me that the most by far the most fruitful and productive um, time of my creative life has come very much as a result of my kids you mm. know because now you know a, a routine or multiple routines have been you know foisted upon me as is my responsibility and therefore you know the days or weeks that sometimes it sort of just drift by um in my 20s uh that's you know it's no no longer an option so there's just more hours that i'm already up and have energy and, and i think also being uh diagnosed with adhd in my late 30s helped a great deal also mm. because um uh, i have some some uh, drugs that help um boost my productivity also but um but yeah i'm a a big um a big fan of that and actually to go to circle back to the very first thing you said about sort of branding and um content and stuff i think i think where you're going with it, it was like the visual component to all this art that we do so the music the the writing and other things the it, marketing it, the just, for me that's like yeah i think i think my existence i think this is okay that's exactly how i used to think about it and it wasn't until i i first held a camera in my hand with intention you know, and 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 not just to sort of randomly capture, you know, friends at a party or something. Excuse me, um, Red Bull. Okay, so um, why is that not part of? Why is that not a beautiful opportunity to for your the 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 seed of 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 your art to to blossom and to take on another. Um, um, this is not something I've ever said before, so this might not come out um, elaborately. But but why does the visual? Why do we think about it as marketing and not like just another opportunity for creative exploration to express the very same ideas, the very same feelings, these ineffable and abstract things that were at the heart of, or, or the concrete and autobiographical things that are behind this music? Um, you know having been a music artist and having been an actor and, and working with artists all the time, it, you know, every artist has their, their thing. You even said it yourself, like of all the things that you do, right. That you feel like songwriting is, is the thing that you feel most confident or, you know, have had the most success, whatever it may be. 
But ultimately, every artist, you know, we're all required to do all these other things, right? And you can't just be uh, one thing. I mean, you absolutely can, by the way, but um, it, it's we're 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 told we're, we we need to be, and it's well, somebody's got to get the word out if it's not you. Um, sure, and, and like it's really does the response the onus falls to the artist. But I mean, I would say like any kind of uh, artist, you know, is, is, you know, uh, it's like, I'm going to jump around here for a second, if you'll permit me, but it's like, okay, so I'm now a business owner. I was a really good sort of photographer and creative director, Mm -hmm. but there's no reason why anyone who's good at anything and decides to start a business, including being an artist, right? There's no reason why anyone should inherently also be a good business person and in fact a lot of times the skills that made you good at that thing are totally uh transferable or or not or like not you know or like Mm -hmm. you know that that rebellious streak is not necessarily something your your bank manager is going to be looking for you know so (laughs) i think that um that's that's thing number one but it also even within the creative sphere if you're you know we all know like there's artists who are like all they really want they want to be on stage communicating their stories there's some who just want to be in the studio whereas i think for you and i that's not that's one of our least favorite creative spaces to be um there's some who just want to be in the writer's room that's really what it's about for them they don't want to go on the road they don't you know enjoy touring they just want to make their music and put it out there um, et cetera, et cetera. And there are people who enjoy a lot of those things. Um, but in the same way, you know, back when I was writing and recording uh, music, um, I was like as limited as it gets. Like I, I like, I sort of like writing songs, um, but I really like uh, the, the sort of community, the fellowship of like performing, you know, the, the energy of that. That was the thing that always drew me in. Total side note, just ADHD moment. Uh, John Denver is also in that mix for you when I think of you. Yeah, you're writing. Sure. Sorry. Okay. Anyway, um, so basically what I'm saying is I never knew how to engage it. And I remember having an argument with an older, wiser, very successful artist who was in my family about the fact that I didn't have my face on my first record. And she thought it was a huge mistake. And I was all like, this is about the songs and the music and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and you know, the points that she was making about allowing fans to sort of, you know, connect with you in some way, et cetera. And, and um, I'm not going to, like, you know, relitigate that. But it's just, you know, the, the, there's a lot... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause and, like, refocus here and say that I always thought of it the same way. The artwork was an afterthought. The photos were like, all right, who's who's got a camera? Who, who's like a who's like the photographer in this scene? You know, mm-hmm. there's usually two, right? Um, you know, I don't care what font really is on this mm-hmm. thing. You know, it's about the music. I want to get out there and play all this kind of stuff, and that's because we think of it as marketing and content and branding, as opposed to you know an opportunity for more create, you know, more creativity or to continue to serve the idea at the core of this, which is why you, you wrote these songs in the first place mm-hmm. and why, why now, why you recorded it a certain way, etc. It's just another way of expressing that, but in the same way that some artists don't really want to be on stage or don't really want to be in the studio or whatever, it's kind of the same thing that some artists can't wait to dive into the visual component and already have a really crystal vision of what that's going to be. But a lot of them don't have no clue, don't really know, even though they have a well-defined routine and process for, you know, the music do not have the first clue of how to enter, how to sort of apply and reshape that process for the visual component. And that is where I've had the, you know, the most, uh, sort of enjoyment and I would say success over the last number of years is through helping guide as needed um, artists through that process. Okay, I love this. So let's talk, mm. let's let's open this up a mm. little bit because the, the, m- where my thought goes is that I'm like, uh, you know, it was, was, is the visual component of the packaging for me is an afterthought? And I'm like, 
not exactly. There's times, there's records that I've made where I was so excited about them and so deliberate and hired people. And um, but as CDs kind of went away, that it's that went away too for me. Like the idea of like working on a on a JPEG that's going to live on Spotify mm. was a lot less fun for me. And in fact, the digitization of art has really been a gut punch for me. Um, and pushed me back into the corner with my paperbacks and my pen and paper because that's, I, I just um, recoil <laughs> uh, at ones and zeros. But, well, that, I just want, Please. who cares about this? But when I think about, well, what the other thing is, is, is I'm, as an artist, who's not really great at communicating the, the vision that I have because I don't totally understand myself to somebody else who's then going to be in charge of like helping me turn that into uh, a cohesive expression for an audience. Um, I'm, I'm afraid of that journey. So what does that look like when you're working with artists who are probably similarly minded? So I would say, um, and, and I, I, um, What's the word? Um, isn't dead air just so beautiful? Um, I will just cut that all out of there. The um, I love no, I, I was in, highly intentional. I I hate to repeat myself, but something you just said there, I think, goes back to that Martha Graham quote and everything we've been talking about, or, or I've been talking about, which is that it's not really that important unless it is a hyper, hyper autobiographical record mm. um, but even then there's there's still uh, this would still apply it doesn't really matter we don't need to do a full uh, you know personality assessment uh, or psychological uh, deep my, dive yeah, Myers-Briggs or anything because but yeah because the thing is is it's 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 the songs like when you were in the studio and you were making those decisions about where, what frequency the hi hat should be, or whatever you know. You you didn't have any, or you, you may you or the producer may not have had a huge amount of doubt in that moment. You knew what was correct for that to serve the song and the idea there. Hmm. It's exactly the same. What we're looking at, it's what's important for us is no different than what's important to the producer, which is. Sure, we're not we're not getting you know Freudian necessarily, but we do treat this part of the process in sort of uh, doctor patient uh, attorney client privilege. It's important for us to have as the visual creatives uh, an understanding of where these songs came from. Why now? Why did you record it this way? So that we can begin the, that journey of expressing it. And so again, what we're looking at is not not even necessarily you. You know, you are a vessel for these songs and this idea. Okay. And so what we're looking at is the idea. Just like I was saying before, if you were able to to capture the idea in, in its inception, you know, all the way through to recording and, and, and the degree to which we're all we all fail to ultimately deliver on that varies, right? Maybe it's one or two songs a record, as you said, you know, but maybe it's it's more or less. But ultimately what what was the what was the goal? What what are you expressing? That's what's important. Mm -hmm. And then how do we how do we express that? And that's sort of the, the beginning of the journey. And so So does that look like is that a conversation you sit with coffee you know, get so a coffee with an artist or we we're so my agency, Weird Candy, we have an incredibly well defined repeatable process that has some customizations to it. And step one for us, once we've agreed to work with one another, because we we're really campaign focused. So once we're in, like we're in for mm -hmm. typically, you know, sometimes it's six months to a year for like a whole release cycle. Um and so the, the, you know, I won't get into that part of it. Once, once we're like, you know, we're in, it starts with a custom questionnaire and it's, there's no open questions. We're not looking for essays. It's actually more like lists of adjectives or, um, you know, uh, when you like, you know, say what, um, I'm trying to think of the last one we did, like, you know, what would be this record would be the perfect soundtrack for which movies or TV shows. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when you think about this record, what are some, what are some adjectives that come to mind? You know, give us 
at least seven, but you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, you know just little, little nuggets that is the the starting point plus you know if you've already collated any visual references we'd love to see them can you send us the lyrics if you're comfortable doing so just but it's pretty short and sweet but it just gives us those tiny little pieces to sort of grab onto i mean any word That's the, yeah. yeah words are so one word is uh, a lot more suggestive and helpful and rallying than zero and but, seven yeah, I mean that would be helpful. Just even that exercise alone for an artist would be helpful in a way. Like I, oh. I think about like, well, what's what? You know, I've got this new song I wrote a month ago that I'm just like, damn, this is like, this is this is up there with the Corby catalog. I mean, I put this this Great is a good song that yeah, I came nice. up with, and um, for me, you know, for me, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, but I'm like, well, what is this? Where does this? What would what movie would this song kind of be associated with? And I guess I couldn't really say that until I heard, like, until I make it. Mm. Right now, it's just the guy playing a guitar. Um, anyway, that's but no, that's I, interesting. Interjection. That is interesting, and I will say it's important to say that nine times out of ten, the music's more or less done by yeah. the time we enter the process. So sure. I will say that. Um, but um, you know, the next step is is like a deep dive, is is a conversation, and we always try to do to have those call them all like discovery meetings but it's basically a, com a conversation where we sneakily extract all the information that we need to get started but uh we try to do it in a at a location that is best m most uh um helpful to the artist that they uh, feel comfortable in yeah like a sort of it's their porch or if it's mm -hmm. at a bar or we've done ones in like smoky back rooms of terrible bars we've done them in porches and of course sometimes we've done them via zoom as well but um but interestingly it's not just a word often it's uh two words that seem to be in opposition or a lot of frequently if we're working with bands where obviously there's sometimes different not necessarily competing but just different ways of viewing the same thing that's always super interesting to us and like trying to find a synthesis you know there um and so that's often the starting point like you know you we you know used these words so just tell us you know but can you tell us a little bit of behind I don't, we don't even need to necessarily know like the entire story um although we're welcome to it sometimes it's private people don't want to we, we don't need them to open up beyond just what we need to make sure we are creating a meaningful and hopefully beautiful you know accurate representation of whatever they were trying to capture in the studio mm -hmm. and um we don't think and it's very important to say that um you know when i started weird candy um i was hyper conscious of marketing because we work with digital marketers in the marketing departments at labels. I mean, that's, this is really who we're directly in contact with all the time. Yeah. And Not the artists, really, so much once the once the process is going. Uh, yeah, I mean, just on a day to day basis, as far as deadlines, what do we need, when do we need it, by etc. Um, you know, they ultimately they are the ones who are creating the list of deliverables or assets that sure. we need to to create, but. Um, I was thinking, you know, like having some business experience, I was thinking, okay, like if I put together a deck of all the work that we do, it would be great to support that with some some hard data, like, you know, artists who hired weird can you know, yeah. this their record Soft performed this much more, or things like this. But the more I looked into it, and I and not just did my own research, but also like sought out, you know, marketing professionals that I knew um, and had worked with at various labels and agencies to say, like, what would you want to see on a deck like this to be like, just make it like a no brainer, you know? Mm -hmm. And the the and the truth is, and it was kind of freeing in a way, is that there aren't any because so much of this is out of our hands. So much is out of any artist's hands. The mm -hmm. timing of when you put it out, you know, the how it's received your fan base like who you know all the things all the and stuff that we don't like right like the marketing and the branding or like the, the execution of that um you know what ha what happens to be in the news cycle the day that you put your thing out that totally you know um it, i think it's fair to say that like the biggest records of all time have have all been 
sort of swept to that level of success because of what was happening culturally in that moment sure. as a pure coincidence. Just tapped into it. Okay. Yeah, it's like obviously like the Beatles after Kennedy and like, you know, Nora Jones maybe after 9-11. I mean, there's a lot of these theories out there, but you know, you know, just what people sort of need culturally um, that's out, totally out of your control. And so it's been a really, I might want to cut that last thing that was going out on a limb, but the point <laughs> is, is that, you know, um, when it comes to this stuff, you, you, there's so little control. So all we can really focus on is making sure that at the end of the day, we create like a meaningful and, and, and accurate and cohesive, you know, uh, uh, campaign to support the, the music. And it's kind of like what you said before, all of that work and all of those moments in the studio where you're dialing in, the pitch of this and the, you know, and you choose the room and the amp and all the rest of it. And a lot of the stuff that we work on has been, you know, sometimes two plus years in development just to get to this stage where we're now ready. And, and the reason I start, the reason I started it is because people like me, and I'm, I'm comfortable now putting myself in this category of creatives of, of artists and designers and animators and things is that you know, you spend two, three years pouring, you know, ungodly amount of resources of time, energy, money into this music. And then when it comes to this visual part, which whatever your opinion and perspective, I think anyone could fairly say it's really important. Mm -hmm. Some would say it's now as much a visual business as it is an audio, but I think we can all say more or less, yeah, it's, it's important, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, People like me and, and, and my designer colleagues will frequently get a phone call being like, hey, uh, we now cover, you know, next Thursday. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's unbelievable. You know, I'm not saying, I'm, I, I, I don't think we can ever expect or would even need parity mm -hmm. on the creative processes. But let's at least, you know, get it up off the floor, you know, yeah. and, and give it, you know, the, the time and the, the energy and the respect that it deserves. And, and so... I've jumped around quite a bit, but all of, all of that to say, like we specifically stay, our work goes right up to, but stops just short of marketing. We're not there to execute. We're just there to help Here's the extract assets. and create the something, something meaning, uh, you know, it, you know, and, and that's a full campaign. I mean, it's all of the design, the artwork, the ad mat, the merch, the posters, the photos, the videos, the animation, like the whole thing. But then, the canvases? Do you guys do the canvases? Yeah, yeah, of course. Come on, let's, let's get real. Yeah, no, the uh, yeah, we do. Ca canvases are usually just like a cut down of like the la the larger piece. But yes, yeah, so, uh, but we, we love doing that. And the and so the the reason we stop short of it actually comes back to that our process of like how we extract this stuff because I usually we usually don't like revealing this until like the end of the process. Mm. But something that's always been very important to me is when we ask all these questions, we never ask. Oh, let me actually rephrase that. We only are seeking answers from within. So we would never ask a lot of uh, creative directors that I had worked with previously like one of the first questions they'll say is like you know who who's out there right now whose stuff that you're you see yourself like in that category that you're digging like what they're doing we would never ask anything like this mm -hmm. it's all from within where does this come from what what colors do you see what do you what does this make you feel like what you know why this we always look for opportunities to try and echo the recording process in the visual process if you recorded to tape maybe let's shoot on film if you said i'm only going to use seven instruments well let's only use seven color, you know whatever it mm -hmm. may be right but um we always like to let artists know that we never asked them not once throughout the entire process a single question about an ex another artist or an external reference mm -hmm. even movies i would I, you know because i mentioned those before is just internal as far as like what they, you know, we're not, they're not pitching as a soundtrack, right? When they mm -hmm. record it. So um, ultimately we want them to feel as much a sense of pride and ownership over their visuals as they do over their music. And that's mm -hmm. the goal. Mm -hmm. um, that makes a lot of sense and as encouraging and empowering uh, and intimidating in so far as 
the artists that I imagine you tend to work with uh, have a modicum of commercial success such that they have a bit of a machine around them, labels. Um, Some, yeah, a lot, a lot of them do. Not always, but sure. Sure. Um, and now I think that's something that a lot of indies face. I mean, this is the story as old as time. But, um, but I, I said the Canva thing is that going to go because that was like Honest the straw Canva. that broke my back. Yeah. I was oh. just like when I put my record, I put a full record out in 2021, and I, I had canvas. a little bit of label help. Mm. And um, you know, I, I I'm actually just about to finish paying off that record, so <laughs> hence hence me getting out the old spade to dig a new hole in the backyard. Um, and uh, but the um, at like I was still just doing so much of the the work myself, and that was something that was doable in the aughts and in the pre pre current iPhone ten age, and it's no longer tenable to me for an indie to maintain that level of daily commitment mm-hmm. to one's audience. Um, and that was a, probably more than anything that made me kind of like want to take a step back from playing the game as hard as I had been. Cause I was playing it hard for a long time. Um, but I found that I'm just like, okay, hold on a second. I, I was in this to write songs, get better at my instrument, um, at, have a, a, a series of compelling interactions, foster a series of meaningful experiences for an audience and repeat that over and over again. That's what I was in it for, you know, and I was willing to drive sometimes 500 miles a day between gigs and put it on the show again. And like it was meaningful enough, but when it became like, nope, now it's like, I've got to put out endless content and cool pictures of me. And I can't compete with 20 year old, beautiful children anymore. And like the Canva thing, I was just like, I remember just like throwing my phone on the ground. I was like, fuck this. I remember like, yeah. I did a little experiment thing with the, with the cactus and I like, I spent a bunch of time on it. And I'm like, for this, this doesn't make sense anymore. Well, not what I'm here for. So yeah, I, I mean, that is definitely a struggle that most artists have. Um, there are obviously some who've ridden a wave. It's opened up doors for those and others yeah. feels like it's, it's, it's uh, you know, finding, you know, finding your way. I mean, there's no, there are as much as, you know, the, the, let's face it, right. These, these big companies, they, they need to have a process. Most corporations require there to be some kind of, they need to be able to provi- you know, demonstrate to shareholders or whatever that they have a profitable model, etc. And so what that means is we need to do X, Y, Z, but as an artist, there's, um, I believe, and in fact, not just me, but like uh, like Weird Candy's senior designer, Destiny Keller and I, we talk about this a lot, about how we are of the opinion that actually, particularly because of everything you're describing, that um, mystery in all its forms goes has always gone a long way, but particularly now, I think artists who are a little bit more, I don't want to say withholding as I am uh, with my kids. Um, I would say, uh, no, the, um, I would say withholding, just sharing to the degree that works for you. And that when you do share, if it took you another two weeks to get that cactus thing, just right to where you were ready to share it. Um, I understand like the needs of touring and, and all the rest of it. It's, it is, it is a struggle. But I would say that just putting little pieces that, that are meaningful and that you're proud of and that, again, serve the idea, serve the music, you know, as fans, this is what we're looking for, you know. Mm-hmm. You saying, hey, gang, um, today this coffee I'm trying today is, or this is today's TikTok dance or whatever, uh, is this is not the audience I think that you're seeking, you know, and uh, these are not the droids. Yeah, and but I would also say, and this is something that I have found over the years, but it took me it, it took me until I became a photographer later in life, um, for me to really appreciate and recognize what an absolute goldmine of creative talent that is around us at all times. Mm -hmm. The beautiful thing about being a musician for the most part is that 
it's an inherently communal thing. Even if you're a solo artist, it's communal with your audience, hopefully. Mm. But, you know, music is there to be played with other people, and it's nothing better, okay? And so you're always around. And even if you are a solo artist, like all those years I was playing at Rockwood Music Hall and the living room and all these places in New York, most of the people in the room were other artists, Mm -hmm. right? And it was so great to have that and it's it i think it made us all better we were supporting one another it was a pretty wonderful uh, atmosphere and when i was an actor of course i was around other actors all the time you know we you, you even more than music actors uh you, you know unless you're only doing one man shows or, or you're a stand-up or something you need that it wasn't until i moved to nashville that it suddenly struck me and i think maybe even the show you, the show that I saw you at, I'm try, I, was it Ninth and something or Twelfth and Porter? Twelfth and Porter, or there's another one that's a intersection. But anyway, there was uh, I was. Yeah. It suddenly occurred to me because I remember that night um, I met like a few. There was a couple of industry folks, and there was a couple uh, at that time when I first moved here. I didn't want to be on the road anymore. I should just say this. The reason I stopped being an artist partially was because I never really made a living on the road. Like I was never a producer. Uh So I would have to spend a huge amount of money just to like make music. And so when I got married, I didn't really want to be on the road anymore. And so I thought maybe I'll just be a songwriter. And I, and that's part of the reason we moved here is because I heard there was a shortage of songwriters here in Nashville. (laughs) And I thought, you know, I'd come help out. He was telling you the truth. And, um, no, the, uh, and I, I, you know, I just gave that a shot for a minute there. Um, but where was I going with that? But the point was this, it suddenly occurred to me, I was going to all these shows as a songwriter, I'm like meeting these songwriters, meeting, you know, I knew some artists, and all of a sudden there was, it, it like hit me, there, there was tons of like industry people, as well as fans, and as well as artists, and as well as musicians, it was like a real kind of cross section of industry and creative in the room, and I was like, all those years I was in Rockwood, at Rockwood Music Hall in New York, it never occurred, I was, like where were all the industry people? Mm-hmm. It was just other artists. Mm. And all those actors I was around, where was, you know, there was one event I went to where, where it was like playwrights were like, had new scenes and they, and they would like do this cool event where you'd, you'd put your name in a hat and they'd pull out and they'd be like, okay, you know, two guys and two ladies and here's the scene, go. Super cool. And that actually was a really, that was a big light that went off in my head because you're not alone as an artist. Uh, there, there's a publicist in New York who supports a lot of indie artists. I don't know if she's still around, but back, back when I was doing stuff, uh, Ariel Hyatt, I think is her name. Mm. This is a deep uh, reach, but I, I should look her up again because I remember her, her saying in like a, I don't know if it was a podcast or a newsletter years ago, we all know what we're great at. You know that you're a great songwriter, okay? And that you're still getting there maybe in, in other things, but you're this is the thing that you're really, we all know the, where our strengths lie, but it's just as important to recognize where we suck because there are people out there who that's their thing, right? Mm-hmm. And that's what they're gonna, and they're, the, and whatever level you're at, they're at the same level of their career too. Mm-hmm. And so it's e- the, the beautiful thing about TikTok and Instagram, all these things, is it's so much easier to connect with these communities that are right, you know, local, they don't have to be local, but frequently are. So finding a young photographer, if you're a young, a young songwriter who you can kind of be on that journey together, or like, you know, we work with like wardrobe stylists a lot, like, you know, people who are designing clothes need people to wear them. Designers and artists is a beautiful mix to support each other as they're coming up. Same with animators, same with people who are starting to shoot film. So even though, yes, ultimately you're the boss of your creative endeavors, um, you know, starting those relationships, you don't have to, you don't have to wait till you're signed to a label with this huge infrastructure where you're not necessarily well served. No, I, I don't want to say that, but I'm just saying that you, you know, they're they're going to have their people that they want that they think are are best for you. And ultimately, you know, uh, uh, just like, you know, Madonna in the eighties, you know, she sat in on every meeting that most artists wouldn't have bothered with. She really wanted to understand. And she was very much running that, that ship Mm -hmm. and we should do no less, you know? Uh, and, uh, so all, all that to say, since I moved here, the, the communities that I've engaged with and found, and found fellowship with has been, uh, really, really beneficial. Yeah, um, I love it here, and I can't imagine living anywhere else until 
I'm done with the whole racket and I go back to Idaho where I belong. Um, and I, I would say that a w wonderful pivot for me that did come in the shadow of the pandemic was where all of a sudden there was no longer, it wasn't possible to tour. Um, I had been very fortunate to be kind of an early adopter on Patreon. Mm. And so I'd, I kind of beat the curve on that um, by a couple of years. And so it was already up and running and that was saved me. You know, it's like a, suddenly I had like a thing that I could, like it was okay. I, I wasn't panicking. Um, and I've since been able to sort of uh, find other ways to keep the lights on. And um, that has been so great because I realized that in my determination to make music at all costs, all I wanted to do was not have a day job. I just wanted to go. And I didn't, I wanted to tour. I didn't want to play. And I wanted to play the kind of shows that I wanted to play. Um, I had very high expectations and I was actually largely able to realize those, you know, I've played a lot of listening rooms. I had experiences that were positive for myself and my audience. And I did them over and over again. And it was, I, w I wasn't frustrated and angry or anything like that. Um, but I was constantly running. And I think that like part of my attitude toward like things like having to do your own canvas and stuff was just this like perpetual exhaustion of just like things I needed to like tick this box because I've got to respond to these four emails and then advance that show next week. And then what, what am I going to be doing four months from now? And, um, so these things were always, whereas like taking a, a breath, slowing down and really like thinking through my next step, um, has been, uh, really a positive experience and development, I think for myself and my art and my audience, um, as well. There's like, um, much less desperation that, uh, I think is always kind of like, uh, nipping at your heels when you're an indie artist, especially a young one, just trying to like figure it out you're just like i'll take that show i'll take mm. that co-write i'll take you know when i first moved to town man i, I did everything with everybody Not i heard everything. i heard about that yeah, yeah nice nice that's um the um <clears throat> yeah and I, I know what you mean and i think that sometimes is is hard is like developing that sense of patience patience and you know the i i feel like it's fair to say that when i speak to artists about their about what they love most which artists they love most it's always the ones who just seemed to like have it all figured out mm -hmm. didn't need anyone had some of that like fuck you attitude that you heard on that mixtape yeah that kind of defiance and self-assuredness that it some you know for most people takes years and years to even get a, a taste of right and that's why I think, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of like slowing down exactly as, as you've said. And, you know, that impatience to get it out and to feel like every day that you're not doing something, you're somehow slipping into irrelevance. You know, it's really important to resist that emotion mm -hmm. and just focus on if it takes another month or two months to get it right to where you feel great about it. And, and that's always my favorite time. As soon as you release anything, whether it's a, you know, a TikTok or a record, I believe it ceases uh, to be, be yours. It's not yours anymore. And, uh, but it is still yours right up until you release it. Mm -hmm. So taking that time to make sure that you feel great about it. And then, and then it's everyone else's. It's a beautiful analogy. I've never really thought about that. I've been like to take that out a little bit more. Um, it's like a, you know, if you do think of your art as a gift that you give your audience, that's, you know, you spend a lot of time on that gift, but once you share it, you've given the gift. That, it's, that's, that's even, that's taking it even in a, in a beautiful direction. I mean, the way I see it is just that I, I've come to see it as really kind of this black and white thing of like, you're an artist. So, so ideas are drawn to you like, like, uh, you know, uh, I guess like birds to a, I don't know what a birds attract, like bugs to a flame or something. I don't know. You're going to be a harness, a lightning rod for ideas. They're going to come to you. Your job is to serve those ideas, polish them up, getting them to where they feel right to you. Sometimes it's already there and you're, it's like that Michelangelo thing of the statues, the statues already in the marble, in the marble, yeah. right? So you're just finding it. And then, uh, you know, uh, you know, Utah Phillips, I bet, I bet yeah, you're a guy who knows Utah Phillips. Okay. Rock Salt and Nails is a great song. That 
So okay. Utah Phillips has this beautiful thing about how we're all standing in this big, long, wide river. And our elders and our ancestors are the tributaries and the streams that lead into this river. And when you make something, when you create a piece of art, you're putting that that rock down. You're putting that down, or that not the not rock, but like a little maybe a, a little boat or something, right into the river, and that's going to flow downstream. And you don't know who further down the stream is going to find it, but they will find it, and they will take from it what they need to get through this world you know and so that's that's just our job I, I don't i don't think it's i think it's a noble and important you know work that we do and frankly i think it's the most meaningful thing that we do um but um but that's just me <laughs> um so yeah man uh, this was that's a good one to end it on uh the idea of art as a gift floating downstream to be found by someone we may never meet thanks yeah. for your time dude you're thanks actually you know contrary to expectations you're a pretty eloquent guy <laughs> oh listen I, I don't care what they say about you I, I, I like <laughs> you're still here mm -hmm. uh all thanks right dude so. that was great, great dude see you. yeah man thanks, thanks a lot for having me. anytime